the water's boiling at this point. Um, and we do have a couple of events right directly in front of us. We have the BRICS meeting and we have an election that we may or may not have. Bill Holter, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing really good. Thank you so much for joining me and coming on. I've actually read your stuff and been known about you probably going on, um, I don't know, it's been at least 15 years or so. So um, it's an honor. So thank you coming on. Um, oh, I wanted to, yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, I wanted to get your perspective here. Um, I've had a lot of people on recently just because uh, things are seem like they're getting out of control and it's coming at a more rapid speed now. And I want to get your perspective on that. And that's a big question. Where are we at in the spectrum? And it seems like we're in some sort of end game. Well, yeah, we're, we are in an end game. I mean, from a mathematical standpoint, uh, fiscally, the U.S. is in the end game of the fiat experiment that started 50 years ago. And when I say mathematically, we just look at the interest that's got to be picked on the deck. It's not them. Um, we're, we're in the final stages financially. Um, you can also see from a societal standpoint that things are ready to, to break apart. Um, you don't understand that the end game is a process and we've been in that process, um, well, you could say we've been in that process since um, since 9-11 because the process of uh, taking taking rights away from the citizenry, uh, maybe that's happened slowly like boiling a frog in a pot, you know, from cold water, you heat it up and, and you boil it. So, I mean, we're, the water's boiling at this point um, and we do have a couple of events right directly in front of us, we have the BRICS meeting and we have an election that we may or may not have that election. So, you know, we'll see, but it's a process that builds up. And at the very end, like Hemingway said, uh, you know, how did, how did you go broke? He said slowly at first, and then all of a sudden, and we're right at that point now of all, all of a sudden, and I've said for years and people kind of laughed about it that when this went, it would be a 72-hour event. And 72-hour event, meaning uh, derivatives are going to break. And when derivatives break, it'll take three days for basically all markets worldwide to close. And once that happens, you're going to see society break down. So the all of a sudden moment is probably directly in front of us. I mean, it could be, it could be any time uh, and for many, many different, you know, potential reasons. Yeah. So, uh, I want to get to the BRICS meeting, um, and the election with you, but I want to go first here. Um, I, the Fed cut, it's been about three weeks ago, which I thought they'd cut, but not at the, uh, not the 50 basis points that they did. Do you think they see something that we don't, or I should say that Joe Q public doesn't see, do they see some danger? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, 50 basis points, the only time they've ever cut 50 basis points has been uh, as an emergency med, as a, as a panic move. So for them to cut 50 basis points with stock markets at all time highs, uh, housing still basically at all time highs. I mean, commercial real estate, has already collapsed. But what it tells me is something, something has broken or is on fire under the surface that we don't see. Yeah. And let me add, let me add that they cut, they cut uh, uh, short term interest rates, 50 basis points, but mortgage rates now, three weeks later, are 40, I think the number I saw last was 42 basis points. Higher, so long-term market rates have gone higher, even though the Fed's trying to lower rates. Yeah, 
there, there that there's almost an irony there. <laughs> they see a lot of long term risk, obviously. Yeah. Well, we, I had I had Simon Hunt on. It was literally forty eight hours ago, and I'm assuming you're familiar with Simon. And his thesis is. He questions, he doesn't say this definitively, but he questions if there will be an election. That's the first thing. So when you mentioned that, it reminded me of my talk 48 hours ago with Simon Hunt. And the second point is the BRICS is having a very important meeting in three weeks. Twofold, how does the election or does the election have any bearing on the BRICS meetings coming up? And do you think that there indeed will be an election or that they're going to, some black swan will hit before then? And then what do you think is going to come out of the BRICS, elect, uh, BRICS meeting? Is that go time? Yeah, I would be surprised if they actually announced that, that the unit is all of a sudden in use. I do believe they'll come out with a peak dot. Rena J, basically laying the groundwork for the beginning of there. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I mean, that itself could be a, a black swan if they, if they go live with the unit, which I don't think they will immediately. I think they're, they're still in a way sometime. Um, but yeah, that it on its own could be a black swan. I'm on the record since last November, uh, that I said, I thought that it was like back then that it was, we only had maybe a 60% chance of having an election. Um, and as time has gone by, I think we're down to, I think there's probably only 30, 35% chance that we have an election. Um, I mean, we could be watching the Black Swan events right now. I mean, with Hurricane Helene, Hurricane Milton. I mean, that, that on its own, um, they may say that there's too much of the population it's been displaced and can't vote. Um, I mean, who knows? But I, I've said all along that if the powers that be believe they're in a position where they can't cheat enough to win, that there would be some type of false flag event, which would prevent us having an election. So we'll see. Yeah. Now, since I have you and you are really your brand your brand is this but really and i say brand this is just what you do in your research but it's also really into metals i'd like to talk to you a little bit about gold and silver and i hope this isn't redundant for you and our listeners and just think of this as just somebody that's completely naive silver gold has been exceptionally strong and it's coming from from what I understand, central bank, foreign central bank buying primarily in the East. Comment about that and also the disparity in the paper markets and the physical demand, if you would, that you know and you're seeing. Yeah, well, first of all, the uh, retail in North America until about three or four weeks ago had softened up. So the May, May through August, period of time, uh, retail demand in North America was weak. Institutional demand and sovereign demand has been extremely strong. Uh, you've seen sovereign central banks, sovereign treasuries buying gold. Um, you know, India's a huge buyer. China's a huge buyer. Uh, you're, you're, you've got gold, you've got gold, uh, in a deficit. You have silver in a super deficit. And silver's not done as well as gold uh, simply because of the amount of paper that's been thrown at it. They basically have tried to keep silver in a because if silver blows through this 3250 number, then basically all bets are off. And silver, I've said this for years, silver would be the fuse to gold exploding. And they, they cannot allow gold to explode because it's, it's the direct uh, competitor to fiat currency. So in order to protect the fiat currencies from gold really going on a one, 
they've had to keep silver in a box uh, just from the standpoint of, you know, if silver was running 50, 60, $100, there's no way gold would stay where it is. You'd see 4,000, five, yeah. seven, 10, who knows? And that would basically show a complete breakdown of trust, a breakdown of confidence. Yeah. So one of the things that's interesting to me is you have New York's really sets the silver price, New York and London. But what happens when Shanghai or the exchanges in the East get significantly higher, if you would, in price? Is there a good arbitrage there or they already do? Yeah, there already is. There already is. The premium has been, uh, and I think it's a little bit softer now, but the great premium has been 3 three fifty an ounce on silver for quite a, quite a while. Um, I think it's very interesting that on Friday, uh, Russia came out and they said that they will be buying other strategic commodities. And the first one they named was silver. Yeah. Silver is already in a huge deficit. Um, they absolutely know for a fact that gold is the Achilles tendon to the fiat, uh, the, the fiat edifice that has been built up. And the way to, to break that is to get a run on gold. And how do you get a run on gold? We just talked about it. What you got to do is take silver out of the box, which is already in a huge deficit. I'll call it 300 to 400 million ounces per year. What you need to do is see uh, a big buyer come in and they can't buy because it doesn't exist. And you get a failure to deliver on Colmex, a failure to deliver on LBMA. It's completely game over. System comes down and you will see the societal breakdown. Yeah, you've seen that already. I want to say with Palladium uh, on the LME. And there was, I think it was Nicol. And this was just a couple of years ago. <laughs> they couldn't tell the work. Yeah, and, and they use the court system to have silver trades. But that doesn't change the fact that the nickel did not exist. Yeah. And what we're going to find out is that like in silver, he's probably 300 paper ounces sold short for every single real ounce that exists. Uh, once you expose that fraud, then it spills over to gold and it'll spill over the same day. I mean, this is not something like, oh, well, silver blows up today and, you know, gold is still hanging around two or three weeks later. No, it's all going to happen in the same day. Yeah. Now, it will be, in my opinion, it will be a failure to deliver, and I believe it will be in silver. That will be what kicks this off. Got it. And you mentioned uh, Russia here. Uh, they seem to be, if you would, almost uh, in the middle of all of this. And again, I was talking to Simon. We have the Ukra Russian-Ukraine war, and now we have the the conflict in the Middle East that more or less is going to quite well involve Russia. Comment on that, and I don't know how comfortable you are talking about geopolitics, but comment on that. And the reason I want to say is because that has profound implications, number one, for our national security, and then number two, with natural resources. What is going on with all the conflict, I guess, is how I'd want to frame it. In my opinion, you have the neocons in the West uh, wanting war. I mean, that's, you know, they're investing heavily in, in defense. So from, a, from a financial standpoint, in the past, it's always been good for an economy to be at war. Uh, in my opinion, I think the neocons are coming to the understanding that they cannot hold this system up. So a war is something that could be pointed at to kick the table over and they can say, well, our, our policies were working except for the war. If it wasn't for the war, everything would have been fine. And basically that, that covers their tracks. Um, I, I do want to go back and I think it's very important understanding that if you go back and look at a chart, I think it was October of 2022, that, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2023, it was October 2023 
when gold really started moving. And the reason it started moving was because the United States, weaponizing the dollar, weaponizing the SWIFT system, confiscated the 300 and whatever billion of Russian reserves. And from the next day forward, gold started moving. And I believe what you're seeing is central banks buying gold worldwide, understanding that, hey, if the U.S. can do this to Russia, they can certainly do it to us. So you're seeing the sale of treasuries and the purchase of gold to protect um, the protect balance sheets. Yeah. And sale of tre treasuries, that is really scary as for the U.S. in a sense, because that's going to put further put yeah. upward pressure on interest rates, correct me if I'm wrong. So oh, we'll make absolutely. Be in a leveraged absolutely. system. <laughs> that's where you can get. Oh, and who's going to buy them? Who's right. going to buy all those treasuries? Once you get uh, wholesale dumping, who's the buyer? The buyer of only resort is going to be the Federal Reserve. So yeah. what are they doing? They're printing dollars to buy up dollars. I mean, that's, you know, there's your hyper hyperinflationary event right there. Yeah. Now that's exactly what you would have. Um, over the next, I would say, oh, good goodness, the election's in about four weeks. So over the next four, four, four weeks to about 12 weeks to the end of the year, is there anything specifically, not even specifically, just in general that you're looking for that you wouldn't be surprised about? What would you tell the viewers and listeners to um, keep a look no, at? At, at this point, I would say you can't be surprised at anything. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If, if somebody five years ago before COVID told you we would be right where we are right now, they would call you a science fiction writer. If somebody told you 10 or 15 years ago that we'd be where we are right now, I don't, I'm not sure there's a science fiction writer in the world that could have written the, the plot for where we are now. So nothing will surprise me. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, there could, be, there could be anything that comes out of the woodwork in the next four weeks going up to the election. And then after the election, I mean, Okay, so Trump wins, and you get a bunch of you get a bunch of people that get paid to burn cities down. That's what will happen if Trump wins, and and that's if he gets installed, because now they're even talking about you know Congress. If it's a Democrat uh, House of Representatives in the election, that they're not gonna they're not gonna ratify him as president. Let's say Kamala wins. Um, I mean, obviously, there's going to be a huge amount of cheat. And I think at that point in time, you will finally see the polite uh, law abiding conservatives. It would not surprise me to see if that's not the case. Uh, and one other thing I think is very, very interesting right now uh, we had Hurricane Helene, we have Hurricane Milton right now. The amount of, of emails that I've gotten showing uh, radar with the electromagnetic pulses, weather uh, manipulation, weather control, which, you know, was conspiracy theory. I mean, everything that we've talked about over these years was originally conspiracy theory and then turned out to be fact. Well, this is like real time. I mean, Milton is just hitting or very close to hitting right now. Yeah. It's being, if you want to call it, fact-checked. And you've got satellite images showing exactly how they're scaring, how they scared Elaine, how they're scaring this storm. And I think that uh, information getting out and, and spilling out to people that strictly watch CNN or MSNBC, they're going to be hard-pressed to say, oh, well, that's just fake stuff. I mean, this is... This is science. And I think at this point, because the information is real time and it is spilling out, uh, it, the term trust the science may come to the fore. And I think you're going to have a lot of pissed off people. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I actually, 
I actually started thinking about that. It was about a week ago, right when this was starting. And I thought about it previously, just the manipulation of weather and how much control they have, but I somewhat blew it off. But then if you just start putting the dots together, I do think you need to take a leap of faith, which I've taken, by the way. Um, just from, it basically started as a tropical storm out in the Gulf of Mexico, turned around, went straight for Florida. And then I saw with my own eyes the, um, just whatever they were doing, they were shocking it with, uh, what do you, with, uh, I don't know what they were shocking it with, but they were shocking it with, it kept on getting stronger. I believe, I believe it's HARP, H-A-A-R-P. We've seen, uh, photographs of North Carolina just prior to the hurricane, completely chemtrail. Uh, we saw photographs in, uh, in Florida, completely chem, chemtrail and, Remember, in those chemtrails, they found that there are there are metallic particles which can be energized. Um, and I I I looked and learned something in the last couple of days that these electromagnetic pulses do not draw the hurricane toward it; they push the hurricane away from it, and that's the way they steer it. So it's H A A R P. It's not conspiracy theory. That's fact. Uh, the government admits that they have harp. And I mean, other than, I, I, well, I'm not a scientist, so maybe there's something else. But harp, you know, they do, uh, it, it is electromagnetic pulses. And I mean, just look at the imagery that's coming out. Right. There's no, in my mind, there's no question about it. These are being steered, and you got to ask who has the steering wheel? And why would they do this? And I think your answer is, where did these hurricanes hit? Extremely red parts of North Carolina, Georgia, extremely red parts of Florida. And what do we have? We got an election in four weeks. There's going to be a lot of people um, without homes that may or may not be able to vote. Yeah. Yeah, that's my neck of the woods as well. Um, I... I was having some conversations with the fr some friends and they said, Andy, do you really think the government would do this? And then I said to them, COVID, did that come from bats? What were we told about COVID? What were well, told we were called, told complete bullshit. Everything was bullshit about COVID. I would go yeah. back further. And just from a personal standpoint, uh, I knew 9-11 from day one was complete bullshit. When uh, you had a BBC reporter reporting that Building 7s had fallen. And I knew all those buildings had been inside of them all 100 plus times, uh, you know, back in the early 80s. And I'm, I'm sitting there screaming at the TV that Building 7 is behind you. Just turn around. My wife was asking me, why are you screaming at the TV? And I'm like, there's Building 7 right there. The guy's saying it, it fell. And then it fell, what, 20, 25 minutes later. From that point forward, everything has been bullshit. I mean, we have been fed, uh, and, and the lies have got bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, you know, along the way. And each one of these lies stripped Americans of their rights, their constitutional and, and even God-given rights. Um, so I would go back. You know, I go back way further than COVID. I go back all the way to 9 11. That was the start. Yeah. So, Bill, um, let's wrap it up. And if people want to know more about you, read your articles, listen to your interviews, or do business with you in precious metals, how do they go about doing that? Well, you can go to my website. It's just simply uh, billholter.com. There is a contact button on the website. Uh, if you want to contact me directly through my business email, it's B H O L T E R at proton.me. Got it. And he's very responsive, very responsive. And uh, I will link to all of this in the show notes below this interview. Bill, again, it's an honor. I just can't thank you so much for your kindness and coming on. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. My pleasure. Take care.